Good morning to you all. A happy September 10th, 2024. And thanks for joining us today for this webinar on GeoTracker Electronic Submittal Information Compliance for California Water Board's Site Cleanup Program Regulated Community. I am Tina Uris, a geologist with the State Water Resources Control Board, Division of Water Quality, Site Cleanup, and Department of Defense Program. And I'm co-hosting this webinar today with Stephen. Hi, I'm Stu Moy. I'm also with Division of Water Quality at State Water Board. I'm with the UST Cleanup and GeoTracker Unit, um, and I'm also a geologist. Um, in the room with us today, uh, we also have Steve McMasters. He's the program manager of the Site Cleanup Program here at the State Water Board. So I'm um, excited for you all to join with us today. Tina. Thanks, Stephen. And like Stephen said, we're jazzed to dive into GeoTracker basics and how to upload all that environmental cleanup information into the online public repository and how this repository is a, truly a collaborative effort between us all. I did learn last week we have folks from other programs here as well, so please keep in mind that the regulations we discussed today may not be applicable for programs outside the site cleanup program. And a big warm welcome to you all. And just to cover the logistics for today's webinar, Participants' microphones and cameras are muted, as well as the chat feature. This webinar is being recorded, and one of the two recorded webinars will be posted later this month on the State Water Board's Vapor Intrusion GeoTracker resources and also the GeoTracker ESI informational web pages. We do have two dedicated stops throughout today's webinar to answer questions you may have, so we appreciate you holding questions till then, where we'll use the raise hand feature. So here's today's webinar agenda, which will be a mix of presentations with live demonstrations, starting with GeoTracker Basics and ESI Portal, followed by our first Q&A session, a quick stretch break, and we'll jump right back into things with the public repository and ending with that second Q&A. So let's get started. We all are here today to discover the basic nuts and bolts of GeoTracker learn the types of ESI submittals and actions GeoTracker ESI users are responsible for, and understand the flow of data and how that is visible in the online public repository. If nothing else, I hope after today, you cannot unsee the party pickles. And remember, ESI is the electronic submittal of information. And you will hear throughout today's webinar, Steve and I using this interchangeably. And of course, there will be more but don't worry, we'll share a handful of resources at the end of the webinar that provides more information for you to refer back to. Oh, and thanks, Hamburger, for this reminder. And another common one we'll use throughout today is GT or GeoTracker. Now I'm going to hand it over to Stephen to dive into GeoTracker basics. All right, thanks, Tina. So, um, you know, a little bit of GeoTracker. Uh, it was really developed back in 2000 to really just look at, um, you know, leaking underground storage tank cases in California, put them uh, essentially on a GIS map for the public and our regulators to utilize. Um, and since then, it's kind of been just blossomed into a mammoth database that contains over 12 different programs um, that the water boards actively use. Uh, and really how, data is kind of stored on GeoTracker is that data is tied to specific site records. So essentially uh, throughout our presentation today, uh, we'll constantly talk about, you know, tying this data to specific um, uh, site records on GeoTracker. And essentially from there, um, our regulators can take a look at um, all this data um, and utilize reports um, and other tools to uh, keep track of, you know, compliance and or um, certain metrics that they have for um, their own programs. On top of that, I did want to mention about a couple of uh, regulations that uh, are related to GeoTracker. The first one was established in January 1st of 2005, where uh, the Water Board established regulations for regulated parties to upload data directly to GeoTracker. That's in regards to California Code of Regulations, Title 23, Division 3, and Chapter 30. Um, sometimes in the presentation, I'll call the, this the ESI regulations. It's really um, regarding to that particular regulation. January 1st of two, uh, 2022 is actually fairly recent, um, and that's related to um, AB 304, where our local agencies are um, 
you know, required to maintain case related documents in the deer tracker for the site cleanup program. Um, some other programs for, for local agencies utilize deer tracker, but then now um, we're getting them on board for cycling as well. And that's those regulations are coming from the health and safety code, as you see on the screen there. Dina, take it away for the next part. Yeah, just to pause for a slide. And historically, this information has been required. It was just as hard copies or a floppy disk that was commonly stored in a file cabinet at an office. But advancements in computer technology have allowed us to now house this information through an internet-based platform where data is accessible to a worldwide audience. By housing large amounts of data in a standard format that is easily accessible to the public, Cases can maintain transparency and improve communication, resulting in quicker access to data and better decision making. Although GeoTracker does not maintain records on the number or identities of parties accessing the database, help desk inquiries and suggest that public users have included environmental justice groups, real estate developers, potential home buyers, environmental consultants, attorneys, and contractors. There's a lot of value in complying with the ESI CIMO requirements, especially with our complex cases in the site cleanup program. And without the regulations and compliance, GeoTracker would not be the case management tool it is today. And now back to you, Stephen. All right. So, so a little bit more background on GeoTracker here. GeoTracker has uh, three different portals. Uh, the first one is for our regulatory agencies. Um, that utilize, um, again, like what I mentioned earlier, uh, a series of reports and tools to not only track uh, data that comes in from the ESI portal, uh, but also um, for other metrics that they need for um, their own uh, project needs or program needs. And also for any PRA requests that come in, um, they can easily utilize GeoTracker to take account of all uh, records that they have for a number of their sites and uh, provide uh, some documentation to the appropriate parties when needed. Um, going on from there, uh, for the regulated parties, we, um, like we mentioned before, GeoTracker Electronics in the Middle of Information or ESI portal is essentially the uh, place where um, a lot of these regular communities um, and their consultants um, or labs can start submitting data uh, directly into GeoTracker. And in the first part of this um, uh, webinar today, uh, I'll be covering, uh, doing a demo of a number of features in uh, the ESI portal. And then Tina's going to talk about uh, one of the special features for the site cleanup program, which is that vapor intrusion building tool. And again, that's all through the ESI portal. And finally, um, the GeoTracker has a public website. Um, no login is required for that. And essentially, uh, after um, a, you know, regulator review and um, their process of uploading documents, all that information is available on the public side um, for anyone to utilize uh, at any point in time. And links to each one of those portals is also on this page here. All right, Tina, next slide. All right, so these are some common terminologies that both Tina and I will be using throughout this webinar today. Uh, so just keep that in mind um, as we're going along here. First one here, Globe ID. It's a unique identifier in GeoTracker um, that represents, or that's uh, associated with each uh, case or site type in GeoTracker. And so I provided a couple of examples um, right there, and we'll try to point it out through our uh, throughout our presentation today of where you can you know kind of take a look at that, or where you can look at get that information um, as you're utilizing GeoTracker. Moving down the list here, uh, there's a number of file types uh, that um, is very common um, when especially looking at both the public side and on the ESI um, portal of GeoTracker. And I'm just going to go down the list here. EDF is just the electronic analytical data that should be provided by the lab. Um, GeoXY is the lat long data. Um, GeoZ is just the top of casing um, elevation data. It's specifically, we're looking at groundwater monitoring wells here. Uh, GeoWell is depth to water data. Ideal, uh, we're looking at uh, groundwater monitoring wells as well, but then that can, this feature can also um, apply to other sampling points as well. 
GeoMap is the map of the uh, site. It could be in PDF, KML, or KMZ file format. GeoBoard is just a PDF of the boring log, and GeoReport is kind of the catch-all for a number of PDF reports and documents that can submit it to a site. And finally, field points, and that field point should represent the sampling point um, at a particular site record, um, but there's two different classifications that I want to clarify with you all now. Uh, one is uh, one is the surveyed um, field point classification, and really, in our code, uh, California Code of Regulations or our ESI requirements, we really want to have groundwater monitoring wells surveyed and, and provided into GeoTracker. That said, um, there's a number of other different field point classifications that we have in GeoTracker, and um, some of our programs do want to have that information um, in the system as it could be um, definitely useful in terms of uh, data review. And so, since it's um, since those other classifications um, are not required by our regulations, we did create a new feature to add in non-surveyed um, lat long coordination uh, coordinates into GeoTrack. And I'll go into that a little bit in the demo um, later in this webinar. But just know that this non-surveyed is just field point. Um, location that can be collected by an online mapping tool, could be a smartphone, a consumer GPS device, et cetera. Um, and doesn't have to be um, surveyed by a licensed professional. Tina, next slide. All right, valid value codes. And so, especially for um, consultants or labs that are putting some of this information together, um, specifically for some of the file types of like EDF, GeoXY, GeoZ, GeoWell. Um, these file types will require some sort of value codes for some of the fields. Um, and essentially, purpose of it is just to provide data consistency when it's submitted uh, to GeoTracker. And it's just, um, and again, these value codes are just a certain, um, you know, certain amount of digits or letters to represent a specific word. For the full list, um, it can be provided, uh, it's provided on our public webpage. And also I'll, in the demo, I'll show you where uh, you can find these codes it's put, uh, on the ESI account, especially for ESI users um, that frequently use that portal. Tina? All right. Well, thanks Go for your intro and we've got the basics down. So let's connect those GeoTracker common terms and valid values to environmental cleanup information, such as that site map, building characteristics, sample location, lab results, well depth, et cetera. And all of these things are collected in the field or analyzed in a lab. Pull us all that paperwork that goes with it and how that goes from being things in the world to being things housed in that cloud. So let's peek into the system and see how that data flows. The responsibility for entry of information into GeoTracker has been split between regulatory caseworkers and the site responsible parties, or RPs. In general, the RP is responsible for ensuring that all site assessment and remediation data are uploaded to GeoTracker. The lead regulatory agency is responsible for ensuring RP compliance and that the GeoTracker record is accurate and complete including regulatory correspondence. Sharing the responsibility of data input between the regulators and RPs helps to ensure that the case record is accurate and up to date. So starting with the blue boxes, the RP or authorized agent claims a case record and creates field points for the environmental cleanup information to be submitted, uploaded, or populated. This information continues to flow into the regulator portal shown by the green boxes and if approved by the regulators QAQC of the submittals, the information will be visible on the public repository shown in that bright purple box. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Stephen, to provide us a little more in-depth look at those blue boxes. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So um, in a demo, I'll be covering a number of this, uh, I'm just seeing the boxes here of just the process of you know, logging in, how to request a site record, creating those field points, and some additional uh, features to check or um, and or submit that uh, ESI submittal. Um, so, uh, next slide, Tina. But before I go to that demo, I did want to add in a couple slides here to talk about, you know, kind of 
getting started, um, especially for um, those on the webinar today, uh, if you're interested in starting to submit uh, data uh, through our ESI portal. When you're creating a, an account on uh, the GeoTracker ESI portal, there's four different account types to take account of. Um, and they'll, the system will ask you that when you're setting up an account. And the four account types are listed, as you see on the screen here, which is responsible party, authorized responsible party agent, and contractor and laboratory account types. So responsible party, uh, starting from the top of the list here, is, should be um, the party legally responsible for the cleanup or um, responsible for that permitted facility. Um, I did want to stress that if um, you're part of that uh, party, so like let's say if you're part of the city and they're legally responsible for maintaining um, and keeping track of submitting data in, in regards to a permanent facility, uh, definitely sign up for a responsible party account. That said, the other account types below there, authorized responsible party agent, um, contractor and laboratory accounts, they should be used by third-party consultants and contractors and labs only. The difference between those account types is the involvement of the RP um, or the permittee in utilizing the GeoTracker ESI portal. So if um, the RP or permittee is not gonna use GeoTracker, they don't want any involvement in terms of submitting data through the ESI portal and they want the, their own contractor or lab to do all that um, electronic submittals, um, on GeoTracker, then the consultant lab would need to set up um, an authorized RP agent account um, and go through the process of requesting access and uploading an authorization form. And the purpose of this form is to indicate to the water boards that this responsible party or this permittee is authorizing um, this consultant or lab to start submitting data on behalf of the responsible party to GeoTracker. Now, for contractor and laboratory accounts, uh, the consultant or lab can set one of these account types up if the RP or permittee is actively using GeoTracker um, and has claimed this facility. And I'll get into uh, why that's important in the next slide here. So Tina, next slide, please. All right. so. What is claiming a facility or site record? So it's indicating that um, in GeoTracker, the R responsible party or RP or authorized RP agent has been approved by the GeoTracker help desk to start submitting files um, under a specific site record or facility record. Um, and the, who receives an access request is actually very important because um, requests sent from the responsible party or authorized RP agent accounts are sent to GeoTracker help desk directly, um, and our team takes a look at them and proves it um, uh, from there. That said, requests from contractor or laboratory accounts are not sent to the GeoTracker help desk, but are sent to the RP or authorized RP agents that already have access or have claimed that access to that facility. Um, I want to really stress that because um, there are situations where um, if the site record has not been claimed by a responsible party or RP agent account, um, the contractor or laboratory accounts would not be able to request access. And if they go through that process, they wouldn't see that through um, the normal means of requesting access. So um, just keep that in mind um, as you're uh, getting started, especially for you know consultants and labs um, that want to start get, utilizing GeoTracker um, and submit the information to the ESI portal. All right, Tina, I think it's time for the demo. We have made it. Yeah. The demo. Yes. We're all excited to hop in, see how to claim a site, talk about those core ESI submittal upload features. And then I'm going to share a little bit about that VI building tool that we have in there for the site cleanup program. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, snag the screen, Tina. All yours, friend. It'll take a minute to load. Let me good, just good. All right. Great. So essentially, um, 
when, after you signed up for an account and you know, went through the process of uh, setting that up uh, and you've logged into your account, essentially this is kind of what you see on the GeoTracker ESI portal. Um, throughout my demo today, I'm gonna constantly uh, refer back to the number of the tools and features on the left-hand side of the page here, um, as this is uh, the quickest way to kind of access a lot of the features through our ESI portal. Now, um, if you're a brand new account um, and you want to start off, you want to request access to a specific site record. And the way to do that is if you go to the left-hand side of the page, scroll down, there's going to be a facility management section. Um, and one of the options under facility management is called request additional facilities. And when you click on request additional facilities, um, you're going to see a number of site records pop up in the middle of the page. And essentially, you want to search for that particular um, facility or site record uh, you want to submit data to. And essentially, um, there's a search feature um, on the very top of the page here, and you can enter in maybe the global ID. Um, again, the global ID is a unique identifier um, for a particular site record. Uh, you could also provide the facility name, status, um, et cetera. Um, more often than not, Global ID is the most reliable way um, to find some uh, a particular site record. But for demonstration's sake, I'm just going to put in an example here. Um, click on search, and you're going to see that um, results. Uh, hopefully, your site pop up in the search results here. Now, one thing, another tip, especially if um, you have a global ID that has like a lot of zeros and it's just like, oh, I don't want to put in all of that or lose track of that. Um, one thing you can do is that if you have a global ID and, um, you know, has a ton of zeros before, um, uh, when you're entering that in, you can put in the last five digits or so of the global ID um, in this search box here. Uh, let me just there right here, click on search. And it's not uh, necessarily directly, I mean, you may have some related global IDs, um, but that could be a, a quick alternative to find um, a related uh, site record. Um, but essentially, if you see your site record pop up on this page, go ahead and click on that checkbox for the site you want um, access to, and then just click on the request check facilities button. You're gonna see a pop up, it's going to provide um, some more information um, depending on your account type. Currently, the account I'm using is the authorized RP agent account. So it's just indicating that, hey, you're going to you know, submit a request, but also make sure to upload this authorization form. Just going to click, click on OK. And essentially, uh, when you see this pink box appear, that's how you know it's been successfully submitted. Your request has been successfully submitted. Now, um, there's a few other steps. Again, it depends on the account type. Um, contractor laboratory accounts, definitely check in with the RP or authorized RP agent that's um, access to this uh, site record so they can approve you. Um, RP account or responsible party accounts, the request is auto automatically sent to the GeoTracker help desk for approval. Uh, for authorized RP agents, it's one additional step that's kind of um, identified in this pink box here to upload that authorization form I was mentioning in the um, slides earlier. And they also, uh, the system also provides you a link to uh, the PDF and Word versions of that authorization form. So you can easily access that form right off here um, and then go ahead and proceed with completing that form. Um, and then afterwards, uh, once that authorization form is complete, uh, you'll be able to upload that form under facility management, upload auth RP form there. So uh, essentially, while this request is still under review, um, you will see that particular site record under pending facilities. And again, that's under the facility management section. Um, if it's the request gets denied, you will see that under denied facilities and um, 
potentially a reason why explaining why it was denied. But if it was approved um, and now you have access to that particular site record, you'll see that under this associated facilities option right here. And if you see that um, site record under associated facilities, that's a guaranteed way to know that you have access to this site record and you can start submitting data into GeoTracker for that particular site record. All right, just one final um, tip um, regarding um, requesting access and getting access and all that. This is a one-time deal. So like if you already have access to this site record and you've done that in the past, you don't have to do this process again for the same site record. This is only for new site records that you want access to. Um, so just keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. All right, so once you have access, the first tool I would strongly suggest taking a look at um, is under the tool section on the left-hand side of the page here, edit field points. And essentially, this feature allows you to go navigate to a specific site record that you have access to and start and manually or um, upload a number of field points um, tied to that particular site record. And so for this case, I'm just going to click on this test project here um, that I have access to on this account. And what you're going to see, um, first thing is that uh, if this is, you know, an existing facility has been utilized by multiple users already, um, you may see a number of field points that have already been uh, created for this particular site record. And you can kind of see that uh, listed out here. But if it's this, if this is like a brand new site record, or a new case, um, this may be just blank and only a few options available to you um, at the top here. But um, just for some context here, uh, the add field points as well construction um, link, this is the manual way you can enter in um, field point information to this site record. Alternatively, you can upload um, field points um, into GeoTracker uh, if you feel that it's quicker um, to do so. Uh, there is a, um, a text file that needs to be uploaded into GeoTracker with its own um, unique format, but that uh, this page will kind of guide you on what information needs to be provided uh, to successfully upload that uh, file. But for uh, this demo today, I'm just going to um, click on the add fuel point slash well construction to show you the manual process of how to enter in fuel points. So first uh, field that we have here is fuel point name. And so essentially uh, this should be the fuel point name uh, representing that sampling um, point. And the fuel point name should match what is provided in the written report. So if you got monitoring wells that are classified as MW-1 or MW-01 or something like that, that naming convention should be matched with uh, within this um, fuel point name field here. So for this case, I'm just gonna put in like um, SG for maybe soil gas and then 200. Um, Field point class. So it's going to be a number of field point class, and this should just uh, be the classification of this sampling point. So it could be um, a remediation groundwater well, it could be a borehole. Um, oh, Tina, help me out. What is it? The vapor sampling point, indoor air, sewer air, gas, yeah. space, our exactly. subplot vapor samples. Yeah, all of that. So um, yeah, we have a, like a long list, but uh, definitely choose um, the best classification for that particular, particular um, sampling point um, from the list available there. Um, this is actually pretty important, especially for um, some of the features that we're going to uh, talk about in that vapor intrusion building tool a little bit later. All right, some of the additional fields that scroll along to the right here, alternative facility ID is really um, only utilized if this um, well is, or well, sampling point is uh, associated with another case record. So uh, case record or that's on a neighboring property or something, so. Um, 
Next field is depth to, you know, top of casing to, um, to wall screen, um, the feet. You can just put any uh, value um, in there. And also uh, the same for length of wall screen, you can put its own uh, unique values in there if, if appropriate. Um, again, that uh, may not be uh, appropriate for all field point classifications. And so um, if it's not appropriate, just leave it blank. All right, so like I mentioned in um, some of the slides earlier, I was talking about this non-surveyed information. Um, and again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we try to add some uh, ways to allow um, our ESI users to provide this information uh, pertaining to uh, the sampling point. Um, and essentially, uh, for field point classes um, that are able to provide this non-surveyed information, you'll see this checkbox available to you. When I click on this checkbox, what's going to happen is that um, an interactive map is going to uh, appear here. Let me just zoom out a little bit so you can kind of see what I'm going to show here. Essentially, um, this icon on the map is automatically located based off the um, site or facilities records lap longs coordinates. And that's determined by um, the regulator when they set up the um, site or facility record in GeoTracker. But at any point uh, when you have this interactive map activated here, you can drag this red icon um, to any area where the sampling point um, is should be located at. And I'm just going to put it over close to <laughs> City Hall over here. But as I'm dragging that um, icon over, you can see that the lat long coordinates is automatically being updated based on the coordinates um, you drag that um, icon to. But if you have the, you know, like lat long coordinates already, you can manually enter that information in, in these fields. Um, for you uh, to utilize. Um, and finally, field point description is um, anything um, that you want to add into that doesn't apply to any of the fields before that. Um, and really, it's just, again, just a better way to better describe uh, this field point or sampling point. So once you're all um, done with that, you want to scroll down to the bottom of this page here, and there's a button that says add this field point. Um, this essentially saves this entry into um, GeoTracker here. Uh, and if it's successful, uh, you'll see that field point listed in the list of existing field points for the site record. Uh, one final thing before I move away from field points is that there's this X icon here. Um, and that indicates that, that this field point has a, a you have the ability to delete this field point, um, essentially. But there are some situations where field points don't have that X. And um, the reason why that um, occurs is that um, this is an indication where uh, data, that could be EDF, GOXY, et cetera, is already tied to um, this field point name. So just to give some more context here, the purpose of these field points is to give the system um, some more information um, where this data should be tied to. So if you're familiar with some of the um, electronic submittals like EDF, GOXY, GOZ, um, some of the fields that are required in those um, submittals are like global ID and field point name. Um, and so Based on that information you're providing in those um, electronic submittals, um, this allows the system to know, one, where um, the data should be going to based off of the global ID or the, you know, for the site record, but also where this data should be tied to for the field points. Um, this is very important for a number of our um, reports and other features um, in GeoTracker. So this is a very helpful. Um, to have um, set up, you know, prior to starting to submit um, electronic data in GeoTracker. So just an FYI, this is one of the first steps to take a look at before 
you go anywhere else? Stephen, quick question. Yeah. Um, say I put in, you know, my indoor air, my crawl space, and I later and realize I forgot to put in my non-survey. Is there a way to go back and add that information after I've already created my field point? Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, so on this page, this is kind of um, nifty that you can um, freely put it in like the field point <laughs> class, the non-surveyed information, the, the description at any point in time. And so like, let's say you later find uh, that you have a, like an indoor air for this one right here that's like oh this should be in a you know certain spot there is an option to do so and all you have to do is just click on that non-survey checkbox there if it's available to you um and then you can freely um, enter that information in or click on edit on map that will take you back to this mapping feature and all you have to do is click on save changes once the changes are made so i'm just going to do that for you real quick here and as you can see, that's been added, automatically added to it. Um, that's very, very nifty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing, yes. Yeah. Once you make um, additional changes here, please make sure to click on Save Changes, especially if you make um, either changes to the classification or like the description here, just to really confirm that you made the changes. And once you've done so, um, you're good to go. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. What's All next? Right. There's so many tools. <laughs> yeah. So next one is the VVL or valid value search tool. So under the tool sections is the VVL search tool. So you're going to click on that and you're going to see a few options here. And so these are all the options um, that require some sort of um, value value code to be entered when you're um, providing this data. So I'm just going to click on GOXY here, for an example, and essentially the system um, can, is going to search through any uh, value value associated with GOXY. Uh, alternatively, we've got some filters here. Uh, if you want to look, drill down to maybe like GPS equip type um, for value value codes. Um, so I'm just going to click on uh, GPS equip type, click on search for values. Um, and it's going to provide you an entire list of value value codes pertaining to that um, field. At any point, you can export that uh, list of value value codes to Excel if you need. Um, all right, moving on here, check EDD. So this is um, our internal checking feature that's already built into um, all of our upload features for. Um, GeoTracker, or at least for these core um, submittal types. And essentially, this is a, a method to quickly check your file without providing some of the additional metadata information when you're um, doing an, up, an actual upload. Um, but essentially, this still uses the Do again a quick check of your file to make sure um, it uh, will upload successfully. You do want to upload that eventually. Um, also, want to mention that and the top of the checking features here, we do have some basic upload instructions. Um, if you um, run into some issues, um, that's available to you. We'll also have some additional resources, but we'll get into that um, later in our webinar as well. All right, so now um, go to the final step, at least for um, actually uploading data documents into GeoTracker. And that's under the tool section, um, upload EDD. And you can see a lot of those, you know, again, terminologies I mentioned earlier, EDF, GeoXY, GeoZ, et cetera. Um, available to you. And this is essentially where you can start um, submitting those appropriate file types um, to the site records you have access to. Now, uh, for today's webinar, I'm not going through every single one of these um, file types, uh, but we do have a Q&A session if you want to uh, talk a little bit more about a specific file type or uh, whatnot. 
Um, I did want to mention a couple highlights here. One of them is GeoXY. Um, and so I'm just going to click on GeoXY here. And the first, um, I guess, screen you'll see here is asking for a licensed professional's information. So like I mentioned um, in my slides here, there was two different types here um, of um, submittals for um, survey data. And essentially for um, groundwater monitoring wells, um, we're kind of requesting the a licensed professional to provide um, their information to indicate that um, this information has been gathered by a licensed professional. And so this is kind of where uh, they can put in this information and then um, upload the file to GeoTracker. That said, I did also mention about non-surveyed um, lat long data. And essentially by just clicking on that um, non-surveyed uh, uploading a non-survey GeoXY file. You're going to see a similar page here, but the caveat is is that um, a lot of these fields that you see here for professionals information is not required, um, but you can be if you so choose to. So just want to make that a little caveat here. So for surveyed um, field points, the licensed professional's information needs to be provided when uploading that information. Uh, going down to G report here. Now, uh, so it's a little bit different. Um, as for G reporting, and this is just a PDF um, of the reports or uh, documents that are uploaded into GeoTracker here. Um, the first page when you click on G report is just so you're going to see a list of facilities that you have access to. And essentially, um, all you have to do is just click on a uh, the facility you want to submit this document to. And you're going to see a um, kind of an upload page. And this upload page is a little bit different depending on the program. Um, some programs have a more of a different customized look to it, depending on what information um, they want to uh, contain in that uh, upload module. Um, but for this site cleanup, this is you're going to look like so something similar to this. So report title. Um, can be whatever um, matches the written report. Um, ideally, it should uh, match exactly like it. So, uh, but in this case, I'm just going to do test upload. Report type. Um, it's going to be a series of questions here. So, if this is a not historic document, or if it is, you would just indicate yes or no on these radio buttons to the right here. In this case, I'm just going to say no. Is this a request for closure? I'm just going to click on no. This is a work plan. I'm going to click on yes for this one. And then what's going to happen is that the system's automatically going to provide you a list of work plan um, types to kind of select from. Um, as you see on the screen here. If I clicked on no, it's going to change it to like other report types. So this is um, the other types of reports that um, can be available to you. So. Um, depending on whatever um, you're trying to upload, uh, try to answer these questions to the best of your knowledge and um, let you do so. Port date should reflect the date um, on the provided on the written report. Um, by default, it's just going to provide today's date, uh, but you can clearly change whatever date um, uh, at any point. Uh, again, uh, file is just to um, there's a simple ability to go to your desktop computer and choose to follow from there. And one final thing here, I want to stress about this EDF feature here. So um, this essentially, uh, the purpose of this is essentially linking this particular uh, PDF document um, to an, an existing EDF submittal that's already in the system. So. One caveat is that if an EDF is not already in the um, system, you won't see uh, that EDF submittal uh, listed on here. And so um, the drawback is that you would need to submit an EDF prior to submitting these PDF documents in order to use, utilize this thinking feature. But just note that this is not a required um, field at this time. So um 
it's just an option available to you um, if you want to uh, link that particular PDF to an EDS middle. This is a feature that we're trying to um, utilize a little bit more uh, and get a feel of just because uh, it, it helps our regulatory staff understand that, hey, there are you know, related um, EDF submittals tied to this PDF. Um, well, we, but for GeoTracker, we acknowledge that you know, not all PDF submittals do require an EDF. So um, we'll keep that in, you know, keep that in mind. Um, and that's why we're not requiring that section right here um, at this time. Uh, and finally, uh, is your file less than 400 megabytes in size? So 400 megabytes is the lim uh, file limit uh, for PDFs um, in GeoTracker. Uh, if your file does exceed that 400 megabyte um, limit, um, our recommendation is to split it up into two different files and upload them them separately um, and you can say in the like the report title uh, title that uh, this is like part one of a report and the other one's like part two or something like that um, to indicate that there's uh, two different parts for that but um, if your file is 400 megabytes in size uh, go ahead and click on the checkbox and then click on upload file and uh, if done six if the file has been uploaded successfully um, you get a confirmation message at the end of this process. And that confirmation message also applies to any of these course middle types under that upload EDD uh, feature here. All right. So now we've submitted our data. Yeah. So what's the next steps here? So on the left-hand side of the page here, under the view submittal section, um, there's a few options available to you. Looking at all submittals, pending submittals, denied and received, these all, all indicating submittals that had been uploaded through this particular account. Now, that said, multiple accounts be, can be um, tied to one uh, site record. Um, and the way to, to kind of take a look at um, all the um, submittals that have been done to a particular site record in the past and not just this particular account can be done under view submittals by facility. So if I click on by facility here, um, what's going to take me is to a page of uh, that should list all the site records um, that I have access to. I'm just going to click on this test project again. And again, like I mentioned, uh, what you're showing here is all the submittals, including ones that have been de uh, denied or accepted or currently impending. And so this is a segue I kind of want to mention about is those status types. So when a submittal um, gets successfully uploaded into GeoTracker, that submittal automatically gets the status of pending. And that pending status, status is retained until one of the following um, actions has been done by either uh, the regulator or the system. And so um, the next status is received. So that indicates that the regulator for the site record has already gone in, picked a look at the document and received um, and or approved that particular submittal. Denied is uh, what it exactly sounds like. The regulator just go in um, and deny that submittal for whatever reason, um, and they can provide a, a simple explanation on why um, that particular um, file was denied. And as you can see here, you have the option to see that reason um, on why um, the file was denied um, on this page as well. And this one final status is um, also known as auto received. So in GeoTracker, if no action has been done to a particular ESI submittal within 30 days after that submittal date, um, the system automatically approves or receives that particular submittal. And so um, the system classifies these uh, submittals as auto-received kind of thing. So just keep that in mind. It, these auto-received submitt uh, submittals are treated just like any other received submittals in the system. One other final caveat um, 
that I want to mention here is that um, for pending submittals, um, if you if this account um, was the one that uploaded this particular submittal um, to the site record, uh, the ESI user does have the ability to delete that submittal um, through their own account. Just note that um, if this submittal has been uploaded through another account that, that also has access to the same site record, um, this other user will only see it listed as pending as a status, but does not have this option to delete this middle because um, they were not the one that uploaded that file into GeoTracker. It has to be the account that uploaded that file that has this delete submittal option available to you. And that is only available with a status type of pending. So yeah, that's a lot of information <laughs> on that side, but it has like a lot of information along with, you know, the ability to look at the confirmation number um, or message tied to each middle and also the ability to take a look at what was the document that was uploaded to, um, to the site record. So FYI on, on that. All right, Tina, I'm going to go through a couple more things here and we'll, we'll segue through it um, to VI building. Cool, cool, cool. All right, going back to the tools section here, I just want to wrap things up here in terms of additional um, tools and resources that you can utilize. Under the tools section, there's a guides and resources um, page. And when you click on that, it would show you um, some additional guides or links to some guides and resources that may be relevant when you're um, uploading um, data into GeoTracker. We also included some program specific guides. So if you're um, in a, uh, if you know your site records in a particular program, whether it be oil and gas, um, or you're uploading like cleanup fund related documents, these are some you know, potentially useful links for you uh, to utilize as well as the general guides we have available there. Going back to the um, ESI portal here, tool section, uh, there's this contact us, um, and essentially that provides the, uh, the GeoTracker help desk phone number and email address uh, for you to utilize. Um, to, and our help desk is available um, to, for any questions you have on GeoTracker. Um, and we can also be a resource, especially if you run into issues uh, when uploading uh, data um, into GeoTracker. Account information um, provides some more information on your account. Um, also, to uh, determine or also shows the account type um, your account currently has. Um, so it, it can be a resource to see like um, if that needs to be updated at any time, especially if um, individuals leave and they have like their email address associated with this account. Um, this is a quick way to see like what's what information is tied to this account. And um, if that needs to be updated, feel free to contact the GeoTracker help desk. And finally, this is take a tour. And so essentially this is kind of uh, like a high level um, run through of everything I just kind of covered. It doesn't go into specific um, uh, tools or features, um, but it does kind of uh, go through a highlight of um, some of the steps uh, that you need to go to uh, to get some of this information. So um, this could be a quick resource um, if you don't want to uh, contact the help desk or look at our additional resources. Or this video, which I hope we can post <laughs> after our webinars um, in the coming month or so. So, all right. Thanks, Stephen, for sharing that information with us. That was a lot. <laughs> You'll get a little break while I talk about this other tool. Yeah. Are we ready? I think so. Okay. Tina, can, did you, you... can you keep, can I oh, keep yeah. screen sharing? Yeah. That? Okay. Yeah. So on the left hand side mm -hmm. under tools, if you go down to other tools, mm -hmm. there's this thing called enter edit VI buildings. And this tool came about about six years ago. Uh, the Cal EPA vapor intrusion worker was developing the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance document and recognize the need to, for a place to house all of this additional data, the metadata that is associated with looking at investigation of that vapor intrusion pathway. 
And so we went and knocked on the geo tracker, you know, help desk and said, hey, can you help us create a place to house this metadata? And so sure enough, here we have in the ESI portal, a way to enter in some more data to supplement that required information that goes along with the reports, that X, Y, those field points. So when you clicked on the other tools, enter edit, it'll populate with a list of the facilities that you are assigned to. And so if you go ahead and click on that facility name, Stephen. I have a question for you, Tina. Of course. Before we go on. Yeah. Today. What if my site is not showing up here? Excellent question. If your site is not showing up here, that means that your site is not a cleanup site type. And so uh, this tool was developed just for the site cleanup program. And so we have the specific site type, the cleanup program sites. Um, so if you have a non-case information, UST, uh, if you're part of the waste, the WDR, yeah. wastewater discharge program, mm -hmm. um, you will not actually have access to this tool. That might not be a forever thing. We'll see as more programs um, include vapor intrusion investigations as part of their cleanup. Uh, maybe we can open this up to others as well. Great Fantastic. question. Thank you, Tina. <laughs> All right. So lucky for us, we do have a site cleanup case here. And when you click on that, uh, it, it brings you to the all the buildings, so kind of this building data set that's available for the site record. Um, so we've gone ahead and created a bunch of different buildings in here just for demonstration purposes. Um, so we're going to go ahead and create a new VI building. And so part of, you know, our vapor intrusion assessments, uh, we actually include a lot of buildings and we go out and we look and um, we start with the building name, um, which hopefully we're, we're keeping these um, using some kind of nomenclature that doesn't actually use anyone's name or actual address. Uh, we want to try to protect that personal identifiable information. Um, so you enter in a building name um, and then uh, kind of go keep going through that building specific metadata. So on site, off site, uh, you know, the year built, uh, building design. We have some drop down uh, options in here. Uh, in the attachment five of that supplemental vapor intrusion guidance, there is a how to document and there's a table that has descriptions for all of these drop downs. Uh, so building occupants, residential, trying to understand our receptors, uh, foundation type, you know, basement, slab on grade, ceiling height, number of floors, VI mitigation, uh, you know, is there a system that is on the building? Also your HVAC, you know, HVAC plays a very important role in how vapor behavior can act. And so um, adding that into kind of what the building has can further help us in our assessments. And lastly, the building square area. So that's really that metadata that goes with the building. Um, there's a lot of more metadata I'm sure you all are collecting, but uh, we are trying to really get those few that you know we can start with we can always build on this um, the next spot is the co-located field points and often within a building you have different areas like a bathroom or a kitchen or you know bedroom one uh, where you collect some kind of co-located um, sampling um, so you have like your indoor air your sub slab or your indoor air to like that soil gas so you you have you know your above ground air sample plus your subsurface that you are trying to co-locate to better understand what the vapors are doing when they're coming in. And so here you can create as many co-located points as you need for a building. So say you had three, five, um, our larger warehouses sometimes you know have 20, 30 sampling points. Um, and then also just trying to continue to associate with that bathroom area uh, your soil, gas, ambient, sewer, if you had the sewer gas sample collected nearby, or groundwater. And as Stephen's kind of going through here, he found our soil gas 200 field point we created. You'll see that the only field points that are showing up are those as part of that field point classification. So it's really important when you're entering in your field points that we make sure that we are selecting the correct classification. So they will be available here in this co-located field points area. So now that we've got our bathroom in our building, thanks Stephen. Uh, if you scroll down, there's one more part to kind of this building profile, and that's an outline of the building to build in those spatial 
attributes into the system to help us start to see in relation to the site where these buildings are and what kind of sampling they have associated. And so we can start building our conceptual site model using these tools in GeoTracker for our vapor intrusion assessments. So just find a random spot, Stephen, and you just click around. Oh, it's like, nope, you gotta scroll in. <laughs> I wanna go like really specific here. This one out of here. <laughs> now you're just clicking around, and then when you get to the end, you just kind of double click, and it shades a red box of filling in where you, where you outlined. And at the bottom, if you go down, you'll have the option to add this building. And once you add it, it'll take you back to that main page and it shows you all of the buildings that have been created for that site record. And so here you can see that this tool is very powerful as you're looking at your vapor intrusion assessments. There's a lot of information and there's multiple sampling rounds. So being able to house this in a structured way is easy for us all to kind of navigate back and forth and kind of get that snapshot of what's going on as data is continually coming in. Um, and also at the bottom here, see Stephen showing us the that red balloon is the site record. And then you see all of the outlines around that are showing all of those buildings in relation to where the site is. And so just think if you have this plus the X, Y for your field points, you can actually start seeing in relation to those buildings where your field points are, where you're collecting samples, you know, how far away a soil gas sample is. There's so much value in adding in this metadata into the system to help supplement all of the other data, the ESI submittals that you are required to enter in. And that is really all for the vapor intrusion building tool that we have just so you're able to enter in, add, edit, and also you can delete out buildings. Um, all of this is kind of like grouped in the system. There is no um, need to link. The system knows that this buildings are associated to this record. And because this record is already uh, tied to the GOXY and your reports and your EDD, so that lab data that's coming in, all of it comes together and really helps you as a case manager, as a consultant, or even just you know public, get a better understanding of vapor intrusion at a site. And with that, I think we are ready to flip back and open it up for questions. Yeah, you want to take the screen thing now? I will do my best to get her back up. There we go. Still think we need some theme music as we're swapping between <laughs> yeah. screens. Read. <laughs> okay. There she's back up. Okay. So thank you all for hanging in there. We've made it to our first question stop. Uh, to ask a question, please use the raise hand feature. Note all participant mics are muted and cameras are off. When you raise your hand is called, the host will say your name and the host will unmute your mic. Please note this webinar is being recorded and prior to being unmuted, you will be prompted by the system to accept permission to be recorded. If you would like to ask a question but would not like to be recorded as part of this webinar, please use the contact information we will provide at the close of the webinar. And remember to lower your hand so Stephen and I don't keep trying to call on you. <laughs> so with that, if anyone has a question, uh, please raise your hand and we'll start ordering or answering an order raised. Yay, we have our first one. So Chris, we're gonna unmute you. It'll take a second and then it'll prompt you for permission and then you'll be able to unmute yourself. Chris, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Takes a few seconds. We're, we'll, we'll work through it. All right, Chris, try to unmute yourself. There we go. Yeah, hi. Hi. Uh, so, what? When did the water board start overseeing VI cases? 
I'm sorry, could you repeat that? When, when did the when did the wire board start overseeing vapor intrusion cases? Uh, hi, Chris. This is Steve McMasters. Uh, we've been working on vapor intrusion cases for many decades. Um, yes, our focus is water quality, but any um, any contaminated site, we need to investigate all media of concern, uh, including soil, soil gas, and uh, and impacted water, either surface water or groundwater. How does that authority to do that overlap with the DTSC? Uh, we share very similar authorities. Uh, ours is through the California Water Code and Health and Safety Code, whereas DTSC is primarily through the Health and Safety Code. So, how does one know which agency to engage with? Um, I think that, you know, not only is it us with the state or the water board and also DTSC, we also have uh, many local agencies um, through the new AB 304 requirements that will also have voluntary um, uh, agreements and um, in their own cleanup programs. And if you're looking for a new lead agency, um, just start having a discussion with one and for the DTSC and the water boards, we do implement something called our Brownfield uh, Memorandum of Agreement, where we'll kind of walk through the process on who should be lead agency. If there's a big water quality impact um, or it's a petroleum UST site, it, we probably should be working with the water boards. Um, if it's a soil only or just a strictly vapor intrusion um, or human health type uh, case, that's when we want to uh, probably request uh, DTSC as your lead oversight agency. But there's a lot of variables involved with that, including um, you may have good relations with a current um, local agency and you want to stay with them. So all those variables go in, into an effect. Okay, thanks. Yep. Thanks, Chris. All right, we have another hand from Denise. We're working on unmuting you. All right, Denise should be. Yeah. There Hi go. there. Sorry about that. Hi, it's been a while for me to be in GeoTracker, so I'm trying to refresh my memory about the, in backing up to. Uh, signing up for a diff, uh, for an account um how am i supposed to know if the global id has been claimed by the rp or not or if i'm supposed to be an arp or just a contractor hmm. yeah um so uh that's like um something to but, work with with your um, with my client exactly Okay. Uh, if they don't know, um, it's probably safe to, uh, um, you know, set up an authorized RP agent account. Okay. Uh, there is a feature um, on the ESI portal that you could utilize, um, especially if you have an existing account already. Um, and that's like uh, through the facility management section here. So let me let me share my screen here real quick. Okay. And Stephen, is this something the help desk could also help with? Like other folks on the call are like, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. That that's another great resource. Um, okay. Actually, um, if you're haven't if you haven't set up an account already, that could mm -hmm. be another to utilize um, and the help desk can um, take a look and see who has access to the site record already. Um, and if, hi, this is uh, Dana Cordano. I'm uh, the manager for the UST cleanup and geotracker unit. Um, so if you are a consultant for the RP, in general, you will usually be an authorized RP unless you are like a subcontracted consultant for their primary consultant. So between the authorized RP account and the contractor account, you would generally use the authorized RP account. Okay. 
Um, can I have, yeah. have another question? Um, it, yeah. So just, just uh, are all, all facilities are typically already set up? What if one is not set up? Or I don't or, see my site in there. Yeah, yeah. so site records are um, set up by your local regulator. Um, so if you have a regional board or oversight agency that you typically work with, um, definitely work with them um, and to verify if it's already set up. And if not, the, um, the oversight agency um, should set one up for you. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Denise. Great question. Okay, we have one more hand and then we'll take that quick stretch break and then pop back in. Give me a second here. Deanna, we're working on unmuting you. All right. Should be good to go. All right. Try to unmute yourself. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Hi. I have a question. Um, I do a lot of phase one ESAs and sometimes through um, the EDR uh, data reports, there will be links to UST kind of like forms from like 1988 generally. Um, and within the report, the EDR report, it will take me to a GeoTracker link where I can actually see these kind of photocopies. And is uh, how I, I don't know where they're getting this information. I've kind of like skimmed GeoTracker before and not been able to see it, but I've seen it on numerous, numerous UST um, facilities in which around 1988, there was like some documents that were somehow stored in GeoTracker somewhere. But when I go directly to the facility or the address, I don't see it. That's a great question. Yeah, we get that a lot at the help desk. And really, where they're pulling that is from a report uh, on GeoTracker. So it's not like um, something you see right away, like right away. It's like really right in one of our reports. And so, um, share my screen. Yes, you can, yeah, you know, I can cool. see your screen. Yeah. Right, awesome. You're so, the GeoTracker public repository. Awesome. Um, so on the public page, um, really, where they're pulling that information from is the historical hazardous substance information report. And so when I click on that option, open, again, this is the main GeoTracker web page here. Um, it's just indicating that um, you know some of the hospital documents. Um, just go ahead and accept. But essentially, uh, we just have like a basic um, feature uh, that we have here. But if you know like a general zip or something like that for this particular facility, um, you can enter that in here. But essentially, um, I'm just going to do this real quick here. Um, let's go with this one. Search. Uh, when you search based off whatever um, search criteria you, you provided, um, the system will spit out um, a number of, you know, best uh, search results kind of thing, along with PDF files. And essentially, these PDF files is where that EDR report's getting that is coming from. Thank you. I super appreciate that. Yeah, no worries. I just learned something new today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely in the weeds, but I'm glad you mentioned that because yeah, that's a that's a common question. Yeah, and and just another note, this is uh, Dana Cordano again. Um, these records are not always displayed on the GeoTracker map because that doesn't necessarily correspond with a site cleanup case. They might have just been underground storage tanks that were removed at some point in time. Yeah, great point. Thanks, Dana. Yeah, yeah, that was like uh, that was a like a separate um, effort um, from um, our predecessors that you know, managed GeoTracker before. Um, and yeah, that's in the, its own separate repository. And like Dana mentioned, it's not going to show up on um, the main GeoTracker map. So it's definitely getting a little bit in the weeds. All right, I don't see any more hands, so let's go ahead and just take that stretch break. 
Um, it said we, we'd be back at 11.15, but um, should we take a few minutes? Yeah. Be back at 11.18? 11.18? Yeah. yeah, yeah okay. Good. That way we've just got a few minutes to stretch. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed that really quick stretch break and are ready to rock. So bringing us back to the data flow in GeoTracker, we just learned the blue boxes in the ESI portal, and now the data has arrived in the green boxes, also known as the regulator portal, which is utilized by the regulatory community and allows case workers to review, validate, and approve ESI submittals, which improves the overall quality of the raw data by maintaining database continuity with transparent data standards and data quality criteria for received ESI submittals. Caseworkers also use the regulator portal for day-to-day -day project management, such as evaluating and making data-driven decisions, tracking funding, scheduling and tracking compliance responses, and updating site-specific information. The regulator portal also includes an interactive GIS mapping tool that allows caseworkers to review nearby data for multiple programs and supports assessing risk to human and ecological receptors based on spatial relationships. This one-stop project management tool not only allows for consistency in case management, but it also helps with transparency, communication, and engagement with the community. Once the environmental cleanup information is QAQC by the lead regulatory agency, the information is visible on the GeoTracker public repository, that purple bright box. If denied, the ESI user will, who submitted the information is notified, like Stephen had showed us in the ESI live demonstration, and it is not visible on GeoTracker's public repository. 
So let's say we follow the data flow to seeing it on that public repository. So the public portal that houses the online repository does not require a user account and can be accessed by anyone with an internet connection at geotracker.waterboards.ca.gov. Through the public portal, the public can view case summaries, statuses, and find the point of contacts. Review and download near, nearly all data associated with GeoTracker records. There are also data evaluation tools such as trend graphs, data summary tables, and customized reports such as all cleanup program sites in the database or how many of those sites have some type of restriction associated with them. Similar to the regulator portal, the public portal has an interactive GIS, GIS mapping tool that Stephen is going to show us all about, and that can be utilized to review and evaluate data through a geospatial lens and view integrated data sets from multiple state water board programs and other agencies. You can also sign up for an email alert to be notified when a document for a case is uploaded. There are a lot more things you can do with the information in the public repository. One more I'd like to note is GeoTracker houses over 285 million analytical records for more than 50,000 contaminated and formerly contaminated sites dating back decades. So it provides a large volume of publicly available high quality data in one spot for all to use for all sorts of research projects. So now that we're all jazzed to navigate that public repository, let's go explore. I gotta stop sharing real quick. Hang with us. And then I gotta share. Will it pop up? Yes, it will pop up. <laughs> there we are. So hopefully now, Stephen, you see it? Yep, yeah, we're good to go. Good. So here's the public repository page the geotracker.waterboards.ca.gov. And when you get here, you can see there's a menu bar at the top, but I already happen to know my global ID because those are very, very important to know. And so I'm just gonna go ahead and paste that in. And when I do that, before I even navigate to the magnifying glass, I see that the system automatically drops down with the case that's associated with this global ID. And so I can simply just go ahead and click on that from there. And it'll take me to the case record. So at the top, we have the name of the case or site. And then and right next to it is that global ID. And then there's a mapping feature. But I'm going to let Stephen talk all about that after we navigate around this record page. So we have our address of the actual site. You have the cleanup program site info, and that's where um, Stephen was asking about for that vapor intrusion tool. This is the program site type that will show those tools. And then you have the status, so that this case happens to be open in remediation. There are also neat things like a printable case summary or CSM report. But down below, there are different tabs, and we're going to kind of go through some of them, focusing really on the ESI and sitemap documents. So starting with our summary, you see here, you have this regulatory profile, and this is entered in by the regulators through the regulator portal. And again, it has the cleanup status, potential contaminants of concern, media of concern, and also other information about DW groundwater subbasins or designated groundwater beneficial uses and watersheds. And then below that is a brief site history, which again is entered in by the regulators, just to give an over overview snapshot of this site. So moving away from our summary, you have this cleanup action report. And this is a really neat report that talks about the actual cleanup actions going on at the case. Steven, is there anything specific here we want to highlight? No, it's really kind of what you're showing already. So it just highlights, you know, what's the method of cleanup, right? You know, it could be sort of that vapor extraction, um, uh, pump treat, et cetera. Um, 
the phase of you know the media uh, that's being affected could be soil, water, et cetera, um, and additional information that the regulator would put in stem uh, pertaining to that uh, cleanup effort. What a very neat cleanup snapshot. Next, let's head over to that regulatory activities. And with music, yes, there we go, nice. <laughs> so here we see a list of all regulatory activities and these would be associated with this site record. And are these, Stephen, just activities that the regulator uploads? Yeah, so on GeoTracker through the regulator uh, portal, uh, the uh, regulatory agencies um, can enter in uh, any information that they want to keep track of for their set, um, site record, and that's essentially what you're seeing here. Um, also associated with these activities, they the regulator can tie um, or associate uh, documents relevant to that particular activity, and that's what you kind of see in those links that says view docs um, on the left there. Just note that not all documents submitted um, on GeoTracker um, are associated to uh, 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 that are associated with an activity. Um, so uh, Tina will show you kind of where you be able to see all the documents for a site record. Just note that these ones are just tied to a specific activity. Thank you. The next tab is that environmental data ESI. This is what we were talking about well, when we we're talking in the ESI portal, all of those submittals that folks are uploading. Here we can actually see those. So starting at the top is this individual well analytical data. And so at the left, you see those field point names. You can actually click on the field points to get more information. You have field point classification and then all the associated information if it is inputted all the way to that field point description. So here you see some of um, folks have been using for indoor air uh, a building so they can associate those field points to the buildings. And if you keep scrolling down below field points and wow, there's a lot of field points. So happy that we have a system to house all of this in an organized way. And hopefully you all are hanging in there as we keep scrolling, close your eyes maybe, we're almost to the bottom. <laughs> okay. So under all the field points, you'll find this section called Laboratory Analytical Report. So those EDFs. So that's all that lab data. And it's all right here in one spot. There's this really neat EDF summary table. And then you can also export all of this data for the case. But let's circle back to this EDF summary table and take a look. So here you see an EDF summary table. And Steven, is this listing all field points and all lab data for a case? Yeah, so that, that's definitely the intent. And based off of the chemical um, that you selected, um, the system will automatically show the concentration based off the available features. Did you want me to go over this a little yes, bit? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. So really, the EDF summary table was a, a feature that we wanted um, our regulators to um, have access to, to really um, help them uh, quickly review their cases. Um, and this is kind of very um, helpful um, uh, for, for them just to, again, uh, speeds up uh, a number of times, uh, or speeds up the time to review a case uh, without going into the uh, PDF, PDF documents and all of that jazz. So, um, but uh, since, um, since we already have that feature for our regulators, we um, sent it out to the public side as well um, for anyone to utilize. So what you see here, um, just to, like um, some more information how to utilize this feature is that um, there's some search features to kind of customize what you see on the CDF summary table. Um, first thing is selecting the appropriate chemicals you want to see, um, take a look on the table. So um, on the top left hand corner, you have the ability to um, select non PFAS or PFAS related chemicals. Uh, PFAS is a definitely a, a up and growing uh, program um, that's um, actively utilizing GeoTracker and um, keeping track of this information. But uh, for uh, if it's you know not PFAS related and if you're looking for other chemicals, you have the option to do so. Um, you can select up to 10 different chemicals to kind of show um, on this 
chart here. And essentially, these chemical concentrations that you kind of see in the middle of the page here, um, if, Tina, could you scroll in a little bit to kind of um, help or zoom in a little bit? Yeah. Uh, this better. concentration, thank you. <laughs> Looks great. Um, so this concentration data is based off of, um, you know, some of the filters that you see on the top left there. Uh, you can have the option to either select by most recent sampling or the ability to select for um, maximum concentration or maximum groundwater concentration. Um, matrix can be, you know, groundwater, it can be soil, um, air vapor, um, et cetera. Um, so based off those selections and you click on go, um, the system will automatically update with the appropriate concentration data. Um, Tina, if you could scroll down to that mountain row we're looking at offline. Um, was, yeah, that one. And all Tina did was just click on that concentration or that concentration data that was provided. That link will uh, be sent to, or will send you to a graph where it shows the um, essentially the concentration data over time. And essentially, you can get a snapshot of that on the graph there. Or if you want to see that in a table of all the uh, sampling that's been done for that um, well and for that particular chemical, you have the option to do so as well. So if you got, uh, you know, ones that have been sampled over time and you kind of want to see a little of that snapshot data, this is a, a method you can do without exporting the data and doing your own uh, uh, digging outside of the GeoTracker. So no more five different hard copies flipping back and forth, looking at 30 different tables and trying to come up with one little graph. It's all at the click of a button. That is so wonderful. <laughs> is there anything else um, that you can do yeah. with the summary table? Yeah, if you can click on view on map of a PCE, for example. All right. P wow. And if you could zoom in a little bit by just using the, the, the plus, yeah, perfect. Essentially, what, what, how this, you know, feature is being utilized is based off that EDF and GOXY data that's been uploaded into GeoTracker. So what you see here is um, one of the mounting well uh, location or well sampling point location. Um, their associated um, field point name uh, and the concentration based off of um, what you selected in that tool earlier. So if you wanted to see like most recent sampling for groundwater uh, for like PCE, this is kind of like, now you can see that spatially um, of all that information. Um, and this was monumental for our regulators. Just like, you really, again, really get that snapshot of, you know, some of the information for their site, um, again, without looking at the year report. So um, this is very helpful for us and, um, and for the consultants and the RPs that have been doing this. Um, thank you so much for your help with that effort because this is making our lives um, much easier in terms of data review. <laughs> okay, All right. that's it for that map. We will have another map to talk about. It has way cool features as well. Um, but let's keep cruising through our ESI, make sure we touch on all that so you know where to find that on the public repository. So that was that EDF summary table. And if you click back to report, it'll take us back to our whole list of field points. And everyone close your eyes as we scroll back down, because I think there's one more thing under our EDFs. So again, a list of all of those EDFs that have been submitted. And then underneath, there's one more section that has the GeoXY, GeoZ, and the GeoWell. So here's another spot where you can export just those submittal types, so GeoXY uh, or your Z or your Well. And so here under the ESI submittals, you have all of this information, but you're probably noticing where are all those reports? And so if you hang on and you scroll all the way back to the top, Apologies for the scrolling. You'll see next to that environmental data tab, we have site maps and documents. Go ahead and click on that and it will load the rest of our ESI submittal types. So those geo map, geo bore, 
and also our geo reports, which we'll find down below underneath this section. And so again, these are just ways to store. You can easily find if you click, say, on a geo map, and that's just the site map that has some information on it. So just housing all of this in an organized way that's easily navigatable for all of us to find. And then under that, you have your site documents. And so here's a list of all reports that have been submitted. And so Stephen had mentioned under the regulatory activities tab, those site documents are just related to the regulatory activities. So if you're like, I can't find something, uh, try here under the site documents and maps, and hopefully it will be shown here. If not, you know, check in with your caseworker or call the help desk. Um, so just houses all of those documents. Um, there's ways to filter so you can find if you were just looking for a specific type of plan or work plan, it's all right here for you. So I'm going to scroll back to the top so we can talk about this second to last tab, the community involvement. And I see Stephen says, you better navigate back. <laughs> what do we got, Stephen? One more thing, um, Tina, the very top of the sitemaps and boring logs section, there's that um, ability to download multiple documents at one time. So uh, if you click on that link there, you don't have to Tina, but essentially that, uh, that link will send you to a page where you can select with, um, you know, one or multiple documents, um, or you can select per section of documents that you want to upload uh, or want to download. Uh, just note that um, depending on your download speeds, it may take a little while or it may time out. So just keep that in mind um, when you're downloading in bulk. But that feature is available to anyone who goes to a separate page. Thank you, Zane. Thank you. That is a nifty little tool to have. You know how many times you sit there and you're like, this yeah. one and this one, and that's <laughs> amazing. All right, so the community involvement tab is a really, really awesome feature and there's so much value here. Um, it has a, a section for public participation, um, environmental justice, and also it, it has a way to house and organize all of the community involvement documents so folks can get a quick snapshot of any kind of fact sheets for public participation, any notices. Um, so you can easily just see what's going on with the community and how we're engaging with these cleanups. So make sure you check that tab out when you're looking at your cases. Um, there is a last one here called related cases. Um, that's kind of where Stephen had talked about that alternative facility ID. Um, this is just a way to um, kind of tie and link uh, this case to other ones that if it needs to be tied to. Uh, last thing on here before um, we go check out this map that we keep talking about that you're all really, really excited about is the sign up for email alerts. And this is an easy way to just get notified about documents that are coming in for this case. Now you just put in your own email and then you're signed up and good to go. Um, so if you're wanting to keep up with what's going on, uh, easy spot right there to do it. So drum roll. I'm gonna, Stephen, do you want me to do the math or you wanted to take screen and uh could you mention about the take a tour on the how to use GeoTracker? Okay. Tab? Yeah, so just a FYI before we go to the map here, I did want to mention that there is a own take a tour under how to use GeoTracker. Again, this is kind of high level of what Tina was just kind of covering. Um, but if you want to just say, you know, a quick way to just, you know, retrace some of these steps, that's available to you as well. And then also some contact us information, yeah. and that'll get you to the help desk. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Okay. We ready for the map? Yeah, let's do it. Tina, you, you want to yeah, try? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Go I'll for it. Yeah. Okay. Click on map. Let's see what happens. Okay. Takes you to a new page. Uh -huh. With no music. Why is this loading? I also want to mention that on the main search page, you know, when Tina um, showed how to, you know, provide the global ID in the search box, uh, and then you, she clicked on uh, the option below it. Um, if you type in like a partial um, a, a address in that box, and then click on the magnifying glass to the right of it, that will also take you to the GeoTracker map. So just an FYI. So there's a another way to find other it. Ways to, yeah, okay. Other ways to get to the map, but um, yeah. 
So here's a map. <laughs> so when Tina clicked on that map link from that site record, um, the system automatically navigates to the particular site record um, that she was looking at uh, just on the map. And um, essentially, uh, there's some features that I kind of want to go over real quick here before our next Q&A session about the GeoTracker for map and um, in general. So the first thing is to access the legend. And the way to do that is if you go to Tina, if you go to the um, upper left hand corner, there's a hamburger button right next to GeoTracker. Just click on that hamburger button. This pop up will appear. And essentially, the first section um, is site records. So um, essentially, uh, what we have in GeoTracker are not only site records pertaining to, you know, site records from GeoTracker, but we also some, have some background links to other agencies' data as well. One of them is DTSC's EnviroStore database, where we have cleanup sites and their own permitted facilities. So if you're interested in you know, seeing the locations of DTSC sites in relation to some of the sites we have in GeoTracker, like cleanup program sites, we have the option to do that um, just on the GeoTracker map here. Um, one other thing to mention here is the other records slash field points slash wells section. Um, and in this part, we have the field points and field points non-surveyed information. Again, this is uh, all information from the ESI portal. Um, and once they've been received in the system or received by the regulator, they can be shown on the uh, public GeoTracker map. Um, and Tina, if you can click out of that legend for me, uh, just to the right there, or, yeah, perfect. Um, you're going to see the map automatically updated based off the, um, you know, the selections that you selected from the legend. And now you see um, a bunch of field points um, on the map there. And, and um, there's some ways to kind of like highlight those field points um, and kind of go with that. We'll get that in a minute. But essentially, um, all the active um, layers or features that you select in the legend, you can see that also on the lower left hand corner there. Um, and at any point, you can easily remove some of the layers or features that you don't want to see in the map. The uh, map will automatically update, as you see there. <laughs> All right, Tina, uh, go ahead and go back to hamburger button. Let's talk about the filters. So we have some main filters for just a site. Uh, records on GeoTracker. And this is really just looking at GeoTracker site records. So not, um, so the other ones like from DTSC um, is not gonna affect that here. It's really looking at GeoTracker sites. So um, if you wanna look for sites that, uh, GeoTracker sites that are currently open, uh, that actually has data associated with it, you have the ability um, to filter out for those um, site records there. In addition, if you wanna, you know, dive a little bit deeper into field points, um, you have the ability to filter for specific field point classifications. Um, as we talked about um, back in the demo of the GeoTrack ESI portal, uh, each field point has its own classification and um, the system uh, will just like filter out for those particular field points based on the classifications you're interested in. So. That's an option as well. All right, map coverages and filter map coverages. Um, so really uh, what's cool, what we have in GeoTracker is that we can set up in the background um, map layers and display them on the GeoTracker map. And uh, a number of these map features either come from um, the Waterbirds um, or from a uh, sister agency. It could be like DTSC, um, uh, US EPA, et cetera. Um, if, if they have that map service available, we we'll, uh, can easily put that in the background of GeoTrack and have that available on the map as well. So Tina, if you could go to like disadvantaged community data sets, um, click on Calib Virus Screen uh, 4.0, um, and then just click out on the map, you can kind of see that um, layer already activated. Probably don't want to screw out too much <laughs> because it will probably load. But Tina, if you could click on one of the um, like uh, squares that you know that are colored on the map there, just anywhere. Oh, not the squares. I'm sorry. The the actual layered perfect. Um, 
if that map has some um, attribute data uh, associated with that layer, um, just clicking on that layer on the map will show you the attribute table that you can um, access and take a look at. So just an FYI on that. Um, and Tina, if you go back to the, the legend again, um, for filterable map coverages, so these are um, little special ones. There's not many, and we're still kind of like testing that out, but um, for these ones, there are some like little features that you can filter for um, uh, for this particular uh, map. So like for disadvantaged community data sets, for instance, um, Cal Extreme 4.0, go ahead and uh, select that one, Tina. Um, this one we can, you know, you can customize, to, you know, look for um, areas uh, that have a score of whatever you put in that percentile. So if you want to look for zero to 30%, you can kind of tech, um, use that feature to highlight areas with that um, cow virus score. So that's just, you know, tip of the iceberg, but um, well, something we're um, trying to look into further. Um, but feel free to unselect that, Tina, so we don't have like a lot of things uh, on the map here. Um, and then go ahead and click off. Oh. That's okay. All right. Uh, can you turn off the military bases Cal Virus screen? Um, yeah. Coverages as well. You want some field points? Yeah. Take uh, probably remove the field point uh, filter. Oh, I see filter. filter. Yeah, there you go. Okay. 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 So now we just got our cleanup programs with our field points, both surveyed and non-surveyed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So um, one thing I want to mention um, is that on the lower right-hand corner, there's that list sites visible on map. And really it's, what it does is exactly what it sounds like. Um, it essentially highlights um, the site, um, their site records that are visible on the map. And you have the ability to choose some of the custom fields that you want to see the lower right hand corner and as you move along and play on the map that section automatically gets updated based off what you whatever is um, being shown on the screen in addition with that there's a feature um and i don't know why that the map is not updating to kind of remove that layer you removed calum virus screen i don't know maybe we gotta go back to the hamburger and try it or something yeah. Let's see. Try to um, do that. Okay, there we go. Perfect. I love it. That's weird. Anywho, <laughs> um, Tina, if you right click anywhere in the map. Okay, right click. All right, so there's going to be a view options available to you. One of them is drop an info pin. We're click dropping. That. And so essentially, this um, feature will allow you to take a look at some of the background information that we have in some of the um, background maps uh, pertaining to that um, point you've uh, you know put on the map essentially and at any point you can freely drag and drop uh, that icon on the map and this data associated with it will automatically update one thing i would want to mention is that limit to sites within x number of feet of this location and tina if you could put like five thousand feet for example and just click on go Essentially, the system's going to put in a radius around it. Yeah, go ahead and click on that X. And you can see, like, any sites um, within that radius uh, will get highlighted. And on top of that, you see that sites map on, on map feature in the lower right hand corner automatically get updated to only include sites within that radius. And what's important is that these. Uh, this these features affect that download data on the top right so in the top right download data drop down menu you have the options to export locations um, to excel so these locations um, are uh, either if you have a radio search um, activated it's only going to export uh, locations of the site records uh, within that boundary um, if you don't have this radio search active uh, it would just export the locations based off the um, sites shown on the map. 
as we were looking at earlier. So it just that's the caveat with this um, look, export locations. And Tina, go ahead and click on that green icon on the map again. Perfect. Um, and yeah, just clicking on that green icon should remove that um, search radius. Uh, if it doesn't, there's also um, an ability to do so on this page as um, well. A few more, you know, a couple more things here. Tina, if you close out of that uh, pop-up, uh, you got your basic uh, Google Maps uh, you know, features on the top right there. You got the map, uh, satellite, night mode. It's really just uh, affecting the background of the, of the map. And you have um, some additional zoom in and uh, drop to, you know, street view um, available to you as well. Tool section. All right. Um, you got some basic features, but one um, pretty nifty one we have there is the analytical data inspection tool. Um, it is a, a beast of a tool uh, and definitely like what we're covering here is like surface level kind of thing. Definitely encourage it if you're interested because the purpose of this tool is to allow you to take a look at um, concentration data for um, sites within an area. So Tina, if you could just draw a simple boundary in a, in a large area. And what the system is looking for is like looking for any um, sampling data for uh, the selected chemical. And at any point, you can select uh, which chemical you want um, from the drop down menu or type in the chemical you're interested in. Um, uh, also, you can change like the minimum of more sweeping values, the date range when it was sampled. Um, can you click on additional tools and filters? And also like data type, groundwater, soil, et cetera, and any other um, uh, options here, including non-surveyed fuel points. That's also crucial um, as well. Well, once you have all this selected there and um, and you want to, you know, update the map, just there's that update map um, option to kind of like update that data. You also have the ability to redraw the boundary if you want to draw the boundary again this is all stemming from edf gxy data and how powerful it can be once it's submitted we have so many options to do in terms of useful tools for um our, our general public especially for um, people who are just looking at data but also again for our regulators to quickly um, take a look at their sites and probably do um, their own analysis wow um Tool section again, Tina, top right hand corner. Um, final thing is there's this another take a tour, really high level again, um, but goes over some of the features I was just talking about. Um, if you uh, need a little guidance and uh, don't want to go <laughs> through our video again or something like that. So that was pretty much it. Thank you. I know there's so much more to share and we're nearing the time. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, but of course, I've got a few things to say before yeah. we get there. Um, getting the PowerPoint up and running again. There we go. I see it on the screen. And navigate all the way back to the end. So I hope you all enjoyed that brief. There's so much more, like Stephen was saying. Um, and I hope you take some time on your own to continue to explore, reach out to the help desk, um, but we've got to wrap up. So I'll just leave you all with this. ESI compliance is important, not only because it's a regulation, but because of the value it provides in case management and transparency. GeoTracker can quickly tie different data types together and visually display multiple data sets in one spot can also generate trend graphs by pulling from multiple sources within the system, and it houses all the documentation for a case record at the click of a mouse. But remember, GeoTracker is as only good as the data inputted, so please don't forget your maps, your border logs, your latitude, longitudes, your well depths, reports, lab analytical data, and even the building metadata.
So then Stephen and I kept mentioning resources. So we do have a lot of resources for folks to, to get more information on this. I know that was a lot. Um, so we have the GeoTracker ESI informational page. I'd start there. It's a wealth of information. Uh, we also, for that VI building tool, uh, the attachment five and the supplemental vapor intrusion guidance document has a how to. Um, so check out those resources. We're gonna open it up for a few minutes of questions. And again, same process as last time. Um, so I see one hand, so we'll unmute you. Um, I, Deanna, I think you already asked a question, so I don't think it'll ask you permission again, but we'll see. You can kick us off. Hi, and now it came up really easy. Um, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so I just wanted to go back to a question regarding the um, email for notification that's on the public side to verify when we sign up for um, an email or notification, that's just notifying us of what the regulator has uploaded to GeoTracker, not necessarily what the um, regulator has accepted from the authorized RP. Um, it should be for both. Um, okay. Yeah, so it should be, yeah, from not only the regular, but also from any accepted ESI submittal. Okay, okay. Um, and I had other questions, but now I can't think of them off the top of my head, so I'll take my hand down for a moment. <laughs> Thank so, you. Yeah, and, and uh, we'll, like, before we leave here, uh, we'll definitely show our, um, you know, information, uh, contact us information, so you can reach us at any point. <laughs> we'll put that up just so folks can start drafting emails. <laughs> uh, while I'm still on the mic, I just do want to yeah. make sure because the last two times, like today and the, the, the previous date, I was not able to log in at the very beginning. Will there be like a recording of this? Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to try to um, post it on our um, the vapor intrusion um, web page, I believe. Yeah, the state water board has a vapor intrusion web page and then also um, the ESI informational uh, page will post this video. Excellent. Well. Along with the slides. Yeah. All right, uh, Chris, I think you should be able to unmute yourself now. Got it. Um, so uh, I don't know what region you guys are from. Um, what region? Yeah. Oh, we're, we're with the state water board. You're at the state level, okay. Uh, yeah. Um, so down in San, the San Diego region. Okay. Uh, you know, region the water nine. Board, the water yeah. board has taken over, you know, all the LLP cases from the county DEH. Um. And in addition, you know the. When the county had them, they, you know, had uploaded cases to GeoTracker. But there's okay. a lot of older cases that the only thing uploaded is a no further action letter. Yeah, and a case closure summary. And in order to get those records, you then have to go through the DH's document library and search for them there and then download them individually and all, et cetera, et cetera. Is there any effort to get all those documents into GeoTracker? Hi, Chris, I can speak to that. This is Dana Cordano. Um, so San Diego County is no longer a certified legal oversight program. So you are correct that, um, you know, the San Diego Water Board has, um, had all of those cases uh, transferred back to them because UST sites per um, a health and safety code can only be overseen by the state water board or one of the nine regional water boards or a certified local oversight program that has certification through the state water board. Um, so as part of that effort, we have been gathering um, information from San Diego County, we are in the process of getting all of the files that we've been given uh, uploaded to GeoTracker. Um, if you are looking for a particular case, 
uh, you are welcome to email me directly and we'll ask them about getting that information. But um, yeah, that that effort is on the way um, because we do know, we did find that they hadn't uploaded a lot of information to GeoTracker. So we're trying to get that in there. And, and who are you again? I'm sorry, I didn't catch My you. My name is Dana Cordano. I'm the UST Cleanup Program Manager and the manager for GeoTracker. So Chris, if you email the GeoTracker help desk, uh, the email shown on the screen, uh, they can help with that, getting those documents that Dana was mentioning. Or get, get you in touch with Dana as well. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Yeah, you can get in touch with me also. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, so it is 12 o'clock. So um, I did want to uh, mention that I think we're available to stay around for a few more minutes. Yeah, and we just have any, one more hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah just so many questions. But, but anyone who's dropping off, thank you again for attending. Um, I hope uh, this find this useful, and uh, please reach out to us um, if you have any further questions. Um, but Margaret, I'm going to unmute you. Oops. Give me a second here. All right, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself, Margaret and ask a question. Okay. Um, I had a... Oh, one more time, Margaret. I don't know why it does I, that. I don't know why it does that. Okay. Yeah. All right. There you go. <laughs> Perfect. I, uh, oh. My question is, is I, I know that there's GeoWell and GeoBore, um, but when I'm looking at a site, I can easily see like the, the groundwater well survey data or like depth to water, is there an easy way to look up as built or boring logs for the construction of groundwater monitoring wells? I mean, it probably depends on what was uploaded. Yeah, but yeah. So the main upload feature for that is what we call GeoBore. That should be yeah. the PDF for the boring log. Um, uh -huh. That said, um, if you don't see that on a particular site record, uh, the GeoBore submittals, it's uh -huh. probably linked to the Geo. Uh, like monitoring reports or something like that. So okay. Dig in there. Yeah, yeah. You, that's the problem is I have to go back through all the old, <laughs> the old reports oh, to try yeah. and see if I can find the, <laughs> see if I can find the information there. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. <laughs> ah, no worries. All right. Uh, I think that is the last hand. Tina, do you want to? wrap this up yeah yeah and as Stephen had said we really really appreciate you all taking the time i know you're busy uh to be here with us today to share you know our geo tracker knowledge and help improve the esi compliance and the site cleanup program um and if you do have any questions or need further assistance please feel free feel free to reach out to the geo tracker help desk uh if you have questions related to that vapor intrusion building tool uh, please feel free to contact the Waterboard Vapor Intrusion team at the dwq vapor intrusion at waterboards.ca.gov. And again, just a final reminder someone um, had already asked, and it was a great question, uh, but we will be posting one of the two webinars that we hosted on the GeoTracker ESI informational webpage, and as well as the State Waterboards Vapor Intrusion GeoTracker resources webpage later this month. Uh, but if you don't see it there, uh, please email us and we can get you a copy as well, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care, everyone. <laughs>